Bienvenidos, worldwide fans of the planet's hottest entertainment with an edge. I'm Ian Fuego here, and I wish you a happy Festivus, Murray Crimbus, all that craziness. We just got done watching Wonder Woman 1984, and I'm Jaime and Fuego, and very pleased to be joined by none other than my beta half. Katie Layden. Yes, and so uh, I needed a female's perspective, a little compare, contrast, counterbalance, and uh, this is the sequel to, I believe, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, 2016, 2017. Regardless, we are a number of years removed from Gal Gadot's initial performance in her own film. Now, granted, she was in the Batman v Superman previously, that's where she debuted as this character, but this is bigger louder, crazier, and the ironic thing is that it's in theaters and on home entertainment with HBO Max. So I have to ask you, how was the experience at home in comparison with watching this uh, in a big, loud theater? Because we just recently saw Monster Hunter together and we were reminded about how fun being back in a theater can be with the proper safety ordinances and all of that. I mean, we have a big enough TV, the sound system is adequate. I... <laughs> that sounds like an insult. I didn't it does. mean it to be, but it it's it was such a great movie. I just feel like I kind of forgot about the fact that I was watching it at home. Granted, you know, if I had watched this in a theater and then come home and watched it again here, I'd be able to give you a little bit better feedback because I'd have a way of comparing. Which we can know, do. The two. I mean. and, and, I think, and I think we should because yeah. I would love to see this on the big screen. This is just one of those movies that is begging to be watched on the big screen. It, it has all those characteristics of a big budget Hollywood movie from the summer. It's got the explosions, it's got insanely beautiful CGI, the colors are jewel toned and rich, and the fabrics are wonderful, and like, yeah, I, I wanna watch those crazy shoes run run across the screen in their in their red and gold splendor on a big screen. I do, I do. Uh, okay, and that makes total <laughs> sense because of the fact that, I mean, I, it's very chick-centric, which is, Cool and very, you know, like I I raise my my fist in applause and approval yeah, for yeah. for all of that. And you know, I I still kind of contend that Gal's acting in certain scenes, like she can do badass like nobody's business. Some of the like actual acting scenes, like there's one in particular earlier in the film where she's talking with Kristen Wiig's character over drinks. It felt a little stilted. It did it felt, feel artificial. Yeah, it feels like that's where she is. A little more exposed, but um, in in the. But then more... again, it almost seemed like her character was a little stuck up. Well, you know, I don't know if I would say stuck up. I would say because she probably doesn't interact that much socially, awkward or whatever. We're we're talking seventy years removed around from the previous film, which took place in uh, in the First World War, and so I'm. Just for like getting the rapid, uh, rapido uh, sort of review thoughts and like overall Im impressions and stuff like this, I did think that in a lot of ways this was a significant improvement from the first film, which you haven't seen. But biggest thing that I do want to mention is that whereas that one you had these very just cut and dry villains, like so one dimensional to speak. is what how you describe them. Absolutely, yeah. I mean I, I, you've got Germans and then you've got this guy in like a gold suit that she's fighting at the end of the film. How are we gonna feel about Germans during World War One? Yeah, can well, we feel any way but one Second way World about War, them? Or, or whatever. Whatever. how many yeah. more wars are uh, we gonna? Have? Okay, anyway, <laughs> just ignore me. Yeah, I'm but, German, so I'm allowed to talk about my own people. That way. I have some German in myself as well. You know, <laughs> it, it's primarily uh, you know Scottish and Irish and Greek, but nonetheless, I I will say that in in the previous film, the villains were, it was very black and white. Whereas the best thing that I appreciated about this, especially with certain things that happened in the third act of this film, you have villains and everybody knows from the trailers, you've got Kristen Wiig and you have Pedro Pascal and both of them, I think the acting from both of them outshines Gal. As much as everybody loves Wonder Woman and it is her movie, the villains and the nuance of both of them and also just the shades of gray that each of them epitomize. Pedro especially, I mean, most people know him from doing voice work on The Mandalorian. He's not in the suit most of the time. He's shown his face a little bit more in this second season of the show, but... He really shined. He, he's he great fleshed in this out movie. this character wonderfully and I... Ah, wonderfully. Ha! Did I? You did it. Was that purposeful? I don't, I don't even know. know. I pun so much now, it's just, it's just a habit. Yeah, that's pretty punny. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, Pedro Pascal, man, I mean, he, in a lot of ways, 
I mean, granted, Kristen Wiig, I, I did not hate her in the Ghostbusters movie like a lot of people did. She's very talented, very funny. Uh, they try to do this, like, sexy spin with her, and she's just pretty. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's like the dichotomy with her and Gal and just the wanting to right. be sort of situation. Well, that's the thing that I want to mention is that it's I... It's the epitome I, of the story is the whole wishful, like, right, just, like, like, just fulfillment sort of thing that well, this movie epitomizes. Gal Gadot has this, like, magnetic quality to her that draws everyone to her, and Kristen Wiig's character wants that, and so she wishes mm -hmm. to have that bestowed she upon her. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, she eventually goes full cheetah mode, but before that, she's she's pretty cool and everyone wants to be around her, whereas before she's just this nerd that, like, everyone doesn't even know she's there. Like, the person that hired her is like, oh, I interviewed you? I don't remember that. Yeah. And so she's lusting after this magnetic quality that Gal, I guess, emanates yeah. naturally, because that seemed like a really, really natural role for her. Even as the maybe. power takes hold with uh, the Cheetah, Barbara, Kristen Wiig character. Which we don't see the Cheetah until the very end. Yeah, third act, like and I so... said. Yeah. But even so, she's still, just like Pedro's character, that there is like, it's not just cut and dry, like very evident evil. This is, there is more complexity to our villains in this, which is why I much prefer a lot of aspects to this. I, I feel like the storytelling was better in this, but I feel like the action was better in the previous film because in this one, I will contend, aside from a uh, setup that they have on kind of a highway in Egypt about midway through the movie, the rest of the action set pieces aren't really as thrilling, although there was one bit in the third act where she is just soaring before oh, she yes. kind of takes on the My gold armor scene. that we see in the yes. in the trailers, which we do see in, in the trailers, her taking on that new outfit. Uh, who, who was the one that, that owned the armor? I can't remember. Was, was it, it Aurelia? Was it Alice? Dare. No, Allison, Allison. no, no, I think I think that was the kid. I'm yeah, trying to remember. Yeah, was the kid. But yeah. anyway, so there's this other character who has the gold armor that was like their ultimate warrior, right? Yeah, yeah. Amongst Which, that group from yeah. ancient Greece or Rome. Or Amazon. They're, they're, they're all Amazonian warriors. And we've, we've seen the opening scene where it's Diana as a child and mm -hmm. she's Which, competing the way, with the adults and that teared you up a dude, little bit too. You oh love that as well. Well, I am a long time sports person. I did a lot of cross country and soccer in, in high school and I just, I love competing and I love being active and like also I actually went to the same high school that Linda Carter went to named Arcadia. Spoiler. Oopsies, <laughs> Linda Carter. She was rumored to be in this, so I, I, it's just a cameo, so don't get your panties in a right. ruffle. Oh, wait, I probably shouldn't say that in this particular Oh, review. that is offensive, I yeah. I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> it just rolled off the tongue. Yeah. I'm coming off as a chauvinist, it's terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so that was a really cool scene. I, I love the opening scene, I love the flying scene, I love all the nice touches of like, Greek and Roman mythology that were thrown in there and like with the artifact, you know, we get some history on that. So it was cool. It was great to watch. Yeah, and she Very mentions... Very inspirational. Yeah, and she mentions the artifact because without getting too spoilery in depth and into the story, basically, we get reunited with Diana 70 years later. It's 1984, hence the title. We get a really just big bite of the self-gratification consumerist culture that was really big in the 80s and, uh, you know, whether it's the scenes at the mall or, you know, playing the arcade games and, and or what Pedro Pascal's character epitomizes with this, what, black gold oil, black gold I think oil. is the yeah, name of this company. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, your life is good, but it could be better, all that different stuff. Right. It, it really epitomizes the way the culture was at the time. And I know that 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 is the running commentary through this is the whole, they even mentioned the monkey's paw at one particular point in it. And it's like, okay, if you had, you know, your heart's fulfillment, what would the catch be, you know, so to speak? And that's, that's an interesting theme. And I think that that's also why this is a significantly better film than the first one in a lot of ways, not in every way, action I still would contend back to, but uh, the heart's fulfillment entails her getting Steve back, you know, Chris Pine returns, but, it's not quite him, and so you know that 
this is like a ticking time bomb sort of situation that is not going to end well, but that sort of wish fulfillment, there is a selfishness to it, and Diana's character even says at one point, she's like, no, I don't want you to go, I, I, I want this, you know, and I, I mean, we all know that... <laughs> That's a universal theme, we can all relate to that. It's American! It, no, it, 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 I know, and, and, I'm but, just and, kidding. And, well, the consumerism is, is specifically American, but mm -hmm. the selfishness... That's just human. Yeah, truly, truly, you're right. And uh, yeah, with a two hundred million dollar budget, this is a this is a globe trotting film in a lot of ways. You go from DC to Egypt. To, I mean, you jump all over the place, and it's it's very well shot. Patty Jenkins, who uh, there's no word if she is going to make a third Wonder Woman film. She's actually working uh, and developing a Cleopatra film oh, with, with Gal Gadot. With Gal Gadot. And there was some controversy over that because people were claiming that the film was being whitewashed. However, Gal Gadot did provide some uh, clarification, uh, and I think it's really important to understand that Cleopatra, as a character, uh, is Macedonian. And she, her family had been living uh, in the European continent for 300 years, so there could have been some interbreeding or whatnot, but to the best of our knowledge, we do believe that Cleopatra looks more like Gal Gadot than anybody else that has played her previously. Hmm. Especially not, what was it, Elizabeth Taylor who played I her previous so. to that? I believe so, yes, way so, back So, day. like, we're getting closer to what she may have actually looked like, but just so that everybody knows, you know, it's like, there wasn't a whitewashing going on there. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, well, as long as they don't have Chris Pine playing Mark Anthony, I'm, I'm okay, <laughs> you know, but... I wonder who will play Mark Anthony. Um, yes, curiouser and, curiouser and curiouser. curiouser. Yeah, so I guess the biggest debate, because I, I really enjoyed this movie, if I'm going to give it, like, a, a rating, it's... I don't know if I would say Certified Fuego. I don't know if I would go four out of five. It's more like three and a half for me because- He didn't like it as much as me. I, I, I did feel like it was a little longer in the tooth than it needed to be. But I feel again, like the two and a half hour runtime was a little much and I contend that. Although interestingly, it ends with a Christmas scene and this like this is no bearing of spoileriness. Like there is like a tree and snow and all this other stuff. And I had to speculate whether that was initially the intention because this film I think it was supposed to come out in July and then they delayed it amidst pandemic to it was like August or October or and something. Are, I think it was October. And then they delayed it to Christmas Day and then obviously this big dual release that a lot of people are wondering how that's gonna pan out. There's scenes in the movie that make it look like it meant was meant specifically to be released on the weekend of July fourth or either oh, close, with the fireworks. close before or yeah, after. I, yeah, because I believe they're flying that, through the fireworks. Now that I now that I remember, I do believe that that was the initial release date was it was coming out sometime in July, right around right. the 4th, and uh, there's that scene in the trailer where her and Steve are flying, and you know, there's all the explosions and everything. Just it watch is, it. It is very well Just shot, man. Patty Jenkins is a badass. I can't wait. Patty Jenkins is the female James Cameron. And you know what? And that is, I shouldn't have even said that. A lot of people that. would say Catherine Bigelow is the female James Cameron since they were married to each other at one particular point, but oh. I mean, none, <laughs> none, nonetheless, Patty Jenkins is doing a Star Wars Rogue Squadron film, which I am extremely excited about. Her father, now I'm even seeing the pilot connection even more so uh, with the story that she put together because of the fact that her father is unfortunately deceased, but he was a uh, US fighter pilot and that's why she oh. wants to that's why she wants to make this rogue squadron flying around in the X Wings like fighter pilot cool. in space Star Wars movie. <laughs> but I'm making as we're doing this review right now, an even further connection with why Steve is so important and maybe bringing him back was so hmm. important to uh you know uh to, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. Fascinating stuff. But uh I I'm saying three out of five. I'm saying it's bueno. It's definitely more like a three and a half for me, but uh, out of five Fuego Fireballs, what would you contend that this is? What's your rating? Full five. Damn, so. Full five. Okay, so Catherine declares it is an in Fuego film, so it is on fire. It's it is literally on badass. fire. If you don't like this after the first 10 minutes you've watched it, you didn't go and see it in a theater. <sighs> okay, I guess I would probably, since I'm definitely declaring three and a half, and I like it more than the previous one, this is four for me. Uh, it's it's definitely certified Fuego, at least in my estimation. Maybe I would have enjoyed a little bit more on a big screen. And uh, It feels for, like it's meant for that, honestly. Yeah. Well, it's 100% meant for that with that sort of budget and with like the caliber of this particular hero uh, with improved writing in a lot of ways in my yeah. estimation. So, the villains are very 
Nuance. They have yes, they they have a humanness to them, and that makes this film meaningful. Awesome. Well, so that is our thoughts, everybody, here on Christmas Day. We were about to head out and see family, but this was like the first uh, the first uh, thing that we had to try to knock out before getting it along. Uh, we're going to check out Soul from Disney Pixar later in the evening after we go see Tom Hanks in the theater. We're going to brave an empty theater with my parentals, so stay tuned for some coverage of that. But uh, I've seen the grande gracias. I've been Jaime Fuego. A like, a share, a subscribe here means a hell of a lot. And... Uh, yeah, guys, uh, there's lots of other spectacular stuff on my other channel, the main YouTube destination for myself and my compadres, which is youtube.com slash the horror show channel. We just finished our Christmas time in hell coverage, all of the Hellraiser books and films and all of that silliness. So uh, a little bit of uh, attention over there would mean a lot. But uh, until next time, I have been Jaime in Fuego. Kitty lit in. And until the reel of cock comes around once more, hasta luego, cinemigos, constant viewers, readers, at times alike, say thank you for some palaver today. Hope we share more of it sooner rather than later. And uh, until then, have a wondrous uh, holiday and uh, stay home if uh, you're feeling safe and watch more streaming shizzle, including Wonder Woman 84 on HBO Max. Peace.